Chapter 1. What is Evolution? A curious aspect of the theory of evolution is that everybody thinks he understands it. Jacques Monod If anything is true about nature, it is that plants and animals seem intricately and almost perfectly designed for living their lives. Squids and flatfish change color and pattern to blend in with their surroundings, becoming invisible to predator and prey. Bats have radar to home in on insects at night. Hummingbirds, which can hover in place and change position in an instant, are far more agile than any human helicopter, and have long tongues to sip nectar lying deep within flowers. And the flowers they visit also appear designed to use hummingbirds as sex aids. For while the hummingbird is busy sipping nectar, the flower attaches pollen to its bill, enabling it to fertilize the next flower that the bird visits. Nature resembles a well-oiled machine with every species an intricate cog or gear. What does all this seem to imply? A master mechanic, of course. This conclusion was most famously expressed by the 18th-century English philosopher William Paley. If we came across a watch lying on the ground, he said, we would certainly recognize it as the work of a watchmaker. Likewise, the existence of well-adapted organisms and their intricate features surely implied a conscious, celestial designer. God. Let's look at Paley's argument, one of the most famous in the history of philosophy. When we come to inspect the watch, we perceive that its several parts are framed and put together for a purpose e.g. that they are so formed and adjusted as to produce motion, and that motion so regulated as to point out the hour of the day, that if the different parts had been differently shaped from what they are, if a different size from what they are, or placed after any other manner, or in any other order than that in which they are placed, either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine, or none which would have answered the use that is now served by it. Every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch, exists in the works of nature, with the difference on the side of nature, of being greater and more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. The argument Paley put forward so eloquently was both commonsensical and ancient. When he and his fellow natural theologians described plants and animals, they believed that they were cataloging the grandeur and ingenuity of God manifested in His well-designed creatures. Darwin himself raised the question of design before disposing of it in 1859. How have all those exquisite adaptations of one part of the organization to another part, and to the conditions of life, and of one distinct organic being been perfected? We see these beautiful co-adaptations most plainly in the woodpecker and mistletoe, and only a little less plainly in the humblest parasite which clings to the hairs of a quadruped or feathers of a bird, in the structure of the beetle which dives through the water, in the plumed seed which is wafted by the gentlest breeze. In short, we see beautiful adaptations everywhere and in every part of the organic world. Darwin had his own answer to the conundrum of design. A keen naturalist, who originally studied to be a minister at Cambridge University, where, ironically, he occupied Paley's former rooms, Darwin well knew the seductive power of arguments like Paley's. The more one learns about plants and animals, the more one marvels at how well their designs fit their ways of life. What could be more natural than inferring that this fit reflects conscious design? Yet Darwin looked beyond the obvious, suggesting and supporting with copious evidence two ideas that forever dispelled the idea of deliberate design. Those ideas were evolution and natural selection. He was not the first to think of evolution. Several before him, including his own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, floated the idea that life had evolved. But Darwin was the first to use data from nature to convince people that evolution was true. And his idea of natural selection was truly novel. It testifies to his genius that the concept of natural theology, 
accepted by most educated Westerners before 1859, was vanquished within only a few years by a single 500-page book. On the origin of the species turned the mysteries of life's diversity from mythology into genuine science. So what is Darwinism? This simple and profoundly beautiful theory, the theory of evolution by natural selection, has been so often misunderstood, and even on occasion maliciously misstated, that it is worth pausing for a moment to set out its essential points and claims. We'll be coming back to these repeatedly as we consider the evidence for each. In essence, the modern theory of evolution is easy to grasp. It can be summarized in a single, albeit slightly long, sentence. Life on Earth evolved gradually, beginning with one primitive species, perhaps a self-replicating molecule that lived more than 3.5 billion years ago. It then branched out over time, throwing off many new and diverse species. And the mechanism for most, but not all, of evolutionary change is natural selection. When you break that statement down, you find that it really consists of six components. Evolution, gradualism, speciation, common ancestry, natural selection, and non-selective mechanisms of evolutionary change. Let's examine what each of these parts means. The first is the idea of evolution itself. This simply means that a species undergoes genetic change over time. That is, over many generations, a species can evolve into something quite different, and those differences are based on changes in the DNA, which originate as mutations. The species of animals and plants living today weren't around in the past, but are descended from those that lived earlier. Humans, for example, evolved from a creature that was ape-like, but not identical to modern apes. Although all species evolve, they don't do so at the same rate. Some, like horseshoe crabs and ginkgo trees, have barely changed over millions of years. The theory of evolution does not predict that species will constantly be evolving, or how fast they'll change when they do. That depends on the evolutionary pressures they experience. Groups like whales and humans have evolved rapidly, while others, like the coelacanth, living fossil, look almost identical to ancestors that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. The second part of evolutionary theory is the idea of gradualism. It takes many generations to produce a substantial evolutionary change, such as the evolution of birds from reptiles. The evolution of new features, like the teeth and jaws that distinguish mammals from reptiles, does not occur in just one or a few generations, but usually over hundreds or thousands, even millions of generations. True, some change can occur very quickly. Populations of microbes have very short generations, some as brief as 20 minutes. This means that these species could undergo a lot of evolution in a short time, accounting for the depressingly rapid rise of drug resistance in disease-causing bacteria and viruses. And there are many examples of evolution known to occur within a human lifetime. But when we're talking about really big change, we're usually referring to change that requires many thousands of years. Gradualism does not mean, however, that each species evolves at an even pace. Just as different species vary in how fast they evolve, so a single species evolves faster or slower as evolutionary pressures wax and wane. When natural selection is strong, as when an animal or plant colonizes a new environment, evolutionary change can be fast. Once a species becomes well adapted to a stable habitat, evolution often slows down. The next two tenets are flip sides of the same coin. It is a remarkable fact that while there are many living species, all of us, you, me, the elephant, and the potted cactus, share some fundamental traits. Among these are the biochemical pathways that we use to produce energy, our standard four-letter DNA code, and how that code is read and translated into proteins. This tells us that every species goes back to a single common ancestor. 
an ancestor who had those common traits and passed them on to its descendants. But if evolution meant only gradual genetic change within a species, we'd have only one species today, a single, highly evolved descendant of the first species. Yet we have many. Well over ten million species inhabit our planet today, and we know of a further quarter million as fossils. Life is diverse. How does this diversity arise from one ancestral form? This requires the third idea of evolution, that of splitting, or more accurately, speciation. Note. See Figure 1 on PDF. Figure 1 shows a sample evolutionary tree that illustrates the relationships between birds and reptiles. We've all seen these, but let's examine one a bit more closely to understand what it really means. What exactly happened when Node X, say, split into the lineage that leads to modern reptiles like lizards and snakes on the one hand, and to modern birds and their dinosaurian relatives on the other? Node X represents a single ancestral species, an ancient reptile, that split into two descendant species. One of the descendants went on its own merry path, eventually splitting many times and giving rise to all dinosaurs and modern birds. The other descendant did the same, but produced most modern reptiles. The common ancestor X is often called the missing link between the descendant groups. It is the genealogical connection between birds and modern reptiles, the intersection you'd finally reach if you trace their lineages all the way back. There's a more recent missing link here, too. Node Y, the species that was the common ancestor of bipedal meat-eating dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex, all now extinct, and modern birds. But although common ancestors are no longer with us, and their fossils nearly impossible to document, after all, they represent but a single species out of thousands in the fossil record, we can sometimes discover fossils closely related to them, species having features that show common ancestry. In the next chapter, for example, we'll learn about the feathered dinosaurs that support the existence of Node Y. What happened when Ancestor X split into two separate species? Nothing much, really. As we'll see later, speciation simply means the evolution of different groups that can't interbreed that is, groups that can't exchange genes. What we would have seen had we been around when this common ancestor began to split is simply two populations of a single reptilian species, probably living in different places, beginning to evolve slight differences from each other. Over a long time, these differences gradually grew larger. Eventually, the two populations would have evolved sufficient genetic differences that members of the different populations could not interbreed. There are many ways this can happen. Members of different animal species may no longer find each other attractive as mates, or if they do mate with each other, the offspring could be sterile. Different plant species can use different pollinators or flower at different times, preventing cross-fertilization. Millions of years later, and after more splitting events, one of the descendant dinosaur species, Node Y, itself split into two more species, one eventually producing all the bipedal, carnivorous dinosaurs, and the other producing all living birds. This critical moment in evolutionary history, the birth of the ancestor of all birds, wouldn't have looked so dramatic at the time. We wouldn't have seen the sudden appearance of flying creatures from reptiles, but merely two slightly different populations of the same dinosaur, probably no more different than members of diverse human populations are today. All the important change occurred thousands of generations after the split, when selection acted on one lineage to promote flight and on the other to promote the traits of bipedal dinosaurs. It is only in retrospect that we can identify species Y as the common ancestor of T. rex and birds. These evolutionary events were slow and seem momentous only when we arrange in sequence all the descendants of these diverging evolutionary streams. But species don't have to split. Whether they do depends, as we'll see, 
on whether circumstances allow populations to evolve enough differences that they are no longer able to interbreed. The vast majority of species, more than 99% of them, go extinct without leaving any descendants. Others, like ginkgo trees, live millions of years without producing many new species. Speciation doesn't happen very often. But each time one species splits into two, it doubles the number of opportunities for future speciation. So the number of species can rise exponentially. Although speciation is slow, it happens sufficiently often, over such long periods of history, that it can easily explain the stunning diversity of living plants and animals on Earth. Speciation was so important to Darwin that he made it the title of his most famous book, and that book did give some evidence for the splitting. The only diagram in the whole of the origin is a hypothetical evolutionary tree resembling figure one. But it turns out that Darwin didn't really explain how new species arose, for, lacking any knowledge of genetics, he never really understood that explaining species means explaining barriers to gene exchange. Real understanding of how speciation occurs began only in the 1930s. I'll have more to say about this process, which is my own area of research, in Chapter 7. It stands to reason that if the history of life forms a tree, with all species originating from a single trunk, then one can find a common origin for every pair of twigs, existing species, by tracing each twig back through its branches until they intersect at the branch they have in common. This node, as we've seen, is their common ancestor. And if life began with one species and split into millions of descendant species through a branching process, it follows that every pair of species shares a common ancestor sometime in the past. Closely related species, like closely related people, had a common ancestor that lived fairly recently, while the common ancestor of more distantly related species, like that of distant human relatives, lived further back in the past. Thus, the idea of common ancestry, the fourth tenet of Darwinism, is the flip side of speciation. It simply means that we can always look back in time, using either DNA sequences or fossils, and find descendants joining at their ancestors. Let's examine one evolutionary tree, that of vertebrates. Note, see figure 2. On this tree, I've put some of the features that biologists use to deduce evolutionary relationships. For a start, fish, amphibians, mammals, and reptiles all have a backbone. They are vertebrates, so they must have descended from a common ancestor that also had vertebrae. But within vertebrates, reptiles and mammals are united and distinguished from fish and amphibians by having an amniotic egg. The embryo is surrounded by a fluid-filled membrane called the amnion. So reptiles and mammals must have had a more recent common ancestor that itself possessed such an egg. But this group also contains two subgroups, one with species that all have hair, are warm-blooded and produce milk, that is, mammals, and another with species that are cold-blooded, scaly, and produce watertight eggs, that is, reptiles. Like all species, these form a nested hierarchy, a hierarchy in which big groups of species whose members share a few traits are subdivided into smaller groups of species sharing more traits, and so on down to species like black bears and grizzly bears that share nearly all their traits. Actually, the nested arrangement of life was recognized long before Darwin. Starting with the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus in 1635, biologists began classifying animals and plants, discovering that they consistently fell into what was called a natural classification. Strikingly, different biologists came up with nearly identical groupings. This means that these groupings are not subjective artifacts of a human need to classify, but tell us something real and fundamental about nature. But nobody knew what that something was, until Darwin came along and showed that the nested arrangement of life is precisely what evolution predicts. <laughs>
Creatures with recent common ancestors share many traits, while those whose common ancestors lay in the distant past are more dissimilar. The natural classification is itself strong evidence for evolution. Why? Because we don't see such a nested arrangement if we're trying to arrange objects that haven't arisen by an evolutionary process of splitting and descent. Take cardboard books of matches, which I used to collect. They don't fall into a natural classification in the same way as living species. You could, for example, sort matchbooks hierarchically beginning with size, and then by country within size, color within country, and so on. Or you could start with the type of product advertised, sorting thereafter by color and then by date. There are many ways to order them, and every one will do it differently. There is no sorting system that all collectors agree on. This is because rather than evolving, so that each matchbook gives rise to another that is only slightly different. Each design was created from scratch by human whim. Matchbooks resemble the kinds of creatures expected under a creationist explanation of life. In such a case, organisms would not have common ancestry, but would simply result from an instantaneous creation of forms designed de novo to fit their environments. Under this scenario, we wouldn't expect to see species falling into a nested hierarchy of forms that is recognized by all biologists. Until about 30 years ago, biologists used visible features like anatomy and mode of reproduction to reconstruct the ancestry of living species. This was based on the reasonable assumption that organisms with similar features also have similar genes, and thus are more closely related. But now we have a powerful new and independent way to establish ancestry. We can look directly at the genes themselves. By sequencing the DNA of various species and measuring how similar these sequences are, we can reconstruct their evolutionary relationships. This is done by making the entirely reasonable assumption that species having more similar DNA are more closely related. That is, their common ancestors lived more recently. These molecular methods have not produced much change in the pre-DNA era trees of life. Both the visible traits of organisms and their DNA sequences usually give the same information about evolutionary relationships. The idea of common ancestry leads naturally to powerful and testable predictions about evolution. If we see that birds and reptiles group together based on their features and DNA sequences, we can predict that we should find common ancestors of birds and reptiles in the fossil record. Such predictions have been fulfilled, giving some of the strongest evidence for evolution. We'll meet some of these ancestors in the next chapter. The fifth part of evolutionary theory is what Darwin clearly saw as his greatest intellectual achievement the idea of natural selection. This idea was not in fact unique to Darwin. His contemporary, the naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, came up with it at about the same time, leading to one of the most famous simultaneous discoveries in the history of science. Darwin, however, gets the lion's share of credit because in the origin he worked out the idea of selection in great detail, gave evidence for it, and explored its many consequences. But natural selection was also part of the evolutionary theory considered most revolutionary in Darwin's time, and it is still unsettling to many. Selection is both revolutionary and disturbing for the same reason. It explains apparent design in nature by a purely materialistic process that doesn't require creation or guidance by supernatural forces. The idea of natural selection is not hard to grasp. If individuals within a species differ genetically from one another, and some of those differences affect an individual's ability to survive and reproduce in its environment, then in the next generation the good genes that lead to higher survival and reproduction will have relatively more copies than the not-so-good genes.
Over time, the population will gradually become more and more suited to its environment, as helpful mutations arise and spread through the population, while deleterious ones are weeded out. Ultimately, this process produces organisms that are well adapted to their habitats and way of life. Here's a simple example. The woolly mammoth inhabited the northern parts of Eurasia and North America and was adapted to the cold by bearing a thick coat of hair. Entire frozen specimens have been found buried in the tundra. It probably descended from mammoth ancestors that had little hair like modern elephants. Mutations in the ancestral species led to some individual mammoths, like some modern humans, being hairier than others. When the climate became cold or the species spread into more northerly regions, the hirsute individuals were better able to tolerate their frigid surroundings and left more offspring than their balder counterparts. This enriched the population in genes for hairiness. In the next generation, the average mammoth would be a bit hairier than before. Let this process continue over some thousands of generations, and your smooth mammoth gets replaced by a shaggy one. And let many different features affect your resistance to cold, for example, body size, amount of fat, and so on, and those features will change concurrently. The process is remarkably simple. It requires only that individuals of a species vary genetically in their ability to survive and reproduce in their environment. Given this, natural selection and evolution are inevitable. As we shall see, this requirement is met in every species that has ever been examined. And since many traits can affect an individual's adaptation to its environment, its fitness, Natural selection can, over eons, sculpt an animal or plant into something that looks designed. It's important to realize, though, that there's a real difference in what you'd expect to see if organisms were consciously designed, rather than if they evolved by natural selection. Natural selection is not a master engineer, but a tinkerer. It doesn't produce the absolute perfection achievable by a designer starting from scratch but merely the best it can do with what it has to work with. Mutations for a perfect design may not arise because they are simply too rare. The African rhinoceros, with its two tandemly placed horns, may be better adapted at defending itself and sparring with its brethren than is the Indian rhino, graced with but a single horn. Actually, these are not true horns but compacted hairs but a mutation producing two horns may simply not have arisen among Indian rhinos. Still, one horn is better than no horns. The Indian rhino is better off than its hornless ancestor, but accidents of genetic history may have led to a less than perfect design. And of course, every instance of a plant or animal that is parasitized or diseased represents a failure to adapt. Likewise, for all cases of extinction, which represent well over 99% of species that ever lived. This, by the way, poses an enormous problem for theories of intelligent design, ID. It doesn't seem so intelligent to design millions of species that are destined to go extinct, and then replace them with other similar species, most of which will also vanish. ID supporters have never addressed this difficulty. Natural selection must also work with the design of an organism as a whole, which is a compromise among different adaptations. Female sea turtles dig their nests on the beach with their flippers, a painful, slow, and clumsy process that exposes their eggs to predators. Having more shovel-like flippers would help them do a better and faster job, but then they couldn't swim as well. A conscientious designer might have given the turtles an extra pair of limbs with retractable shovel-like appendages. But turtles, like all reptiles, are stuck with a developmental plan that limits their limbs to four. Organisms aren't just at the mercy of the luck of the mutational draw, but are also constrained by their development and evolutionary history. Mutations are changes in traits that already exist. They almost never create brand new features. This means that evolution must build a new species starting with the design of its ancestors. Evolution is like an architect 
who cannot design a building from scratch, but must build every new structure by adapting a pre-existing building, keeping the structure habitable all the while. This leads to some compromises. We men, for example, would be better off if our testes formed directly outside the body, where the cooler temperature is better for sperm. The testes, however, begin development in the abdomen. When the fetus is six or seven months old, they migrate down into the scrotum through two channels called the inguinal canals, removing them from the damaging heat of the rest of the body. Those canals leave weak spots in the body wall that make men prone to inguinal hernias. These hernias are bad. They can obstruct the intestine and sometimes cause death in the years before surgery. No intelligent designer would have given us this torturous testicular journey. We're stuck with it because we inherited our developmental program for making testes from fish-like ancestors, whose gonads developed and remained completely within the abdomen. We begin development with fish-like internal testes, and our testicular descent evolved later, as a clumsy add-on. So natural selection does not yield perfection, only improvements over what came before. It produces the fitter, not the fittest. And although selection gives the appearance of design, that design may often be imperfect. Ironically, it is in those imperfections, as we'll see in Chapter 3, that we find important evidence for evolution. This brings us to the last of evolutionary theory's six points. Processes other than natural selection can cause evolutionary change. The most important is simple random changes in the proportion of genes caused by the fact that different families have different numbers of offspring. This leads to evolutionary change that, being random, has nothing to do with adaptation. The influence of this process on important evolutionary change, though, is probably minor, because it does not have the molding power of natural selection. Natural selection remains the only process that can produce adaptation. Nevertheless, we'll see in Chapter 5 that genetic drift may play some evolutionary role in small populations, and probably accounts for some non-adaptive features of DNA. These, then, are the six parts of evolutionary theory. Some parts are intimately connected. If speciation is true, for instance, then common ancestry must also be true. But some parts are independent of others. Evolution might occur, for example, but it need not occur gradually. Some mutationists in the early 20th century thought that a species could instantly produce a radically different species via a single monster mutation. The renowned zoologist Richard Goldschmidt, for example, once argued that the first creature recognizable as a bird might have hatched from an egg laid by an unambiguous reptile. Such claims could be tested. Mutationism predicts that new groups should arise instantly from old ones without transitions in the fossil record. But the fossils tell us that this is not the way evolution works. Nevertheless, such tests show that different parts of Darwinism can be tested independently. Alternatively, evolution might be true, but natural selection might not be its cause. Many biologists, for instance, once thought that evolution occurred by a mystical and teleological force. Organisms were said to have an inner drive that made species change in certain prescribed directions. This kind of drive was said to have propelled the evolution of the huge canine teeth of saber-toothed tigers, making the teeth get larger and larger, regardless of their usefulness, until the animal could not close its mouth and the species starved itself to extinction. We now know that there's no evidence for teleological forces. Saber-toothed tigers did not, in fact, starve to death, but lived happily with oversized canines for millions of years before they went extinct for other reasons. Yet the fact that evolution might have different causes was one reason why biologists accepted evolution many decades before accepting natural selection. So much for the claims of evolutionary theory. But here's an important and commonly heard refrain. Evolution is only a theory, isn't it? Addressing an evangelical group in Texas in 1980, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan characterized evolution this way. 
Well, it is a theory. It is a scientific theory only, and it has in recent years been challenged in the world of science and is not yet believed in the scientific community to be as infallible as it once was believed. The key word in this quote is only, only a theory. The implication is that there is something not quite right about a theory, that it is a mere speculation and very likely wrong. Indeed, the everyday connotation of theory is guess, as in, my theory is that Fred is crazy about Sue. But in science, the word theory means something completely different, conveying far more assurance and rigor than the notion of a simple guess. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a scientific theory is a statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles, or causes of something known or observed. Thus we can speak of the theory of gravity as the proposition that all objects with mass attract one another according to a strict relationship involving the distance between them. Or we talk of the theory of relativity, which makes specific claims about the speed of light and the curvature of space-time. There are two points I want to emphasize here. First, in science, a theory is much more than just a speculation about how things are. It is a well-thought-out group of propositions meant to explain facts about the real world. Atomic theory isn't just the statement that atoms exist. It's a statement about how atoms interact with one another, form compounds, and behave chemically. Similarly, the theory of evolution is more than just the statement that evolution happened. It is an extensively documented set of principles. I've described six major ones that explain how and why evolution happens. This brings us to the second point. For a theory to be considered scientific, it must be testable and make verifiable predictions. That is, we must be able to make observations about the real world that either support it or disprove it. Atomic theory was initially speculative, but gained more and more credibility as data from chemistry piled up, supporting the existence of atoms. Although we couldn't actually see atoms until scanning probe microscopy was invented in 1981, and under the microscope they do look like the little balls we envision, scientists were already convinced long before that atoms were real. Similarly, a good theory makes predictions about what we should find if we look more closely at nature. And if those predictions are met, it gives us more confidence that the theory is true. Einstein's general theory of relativity, proposed in 1916, predicted that light would be bent as it passed by a large celestial body. To be technical, the gravity of such a body distorts space-time, which distorts the path of nearby photons. Sure enough, Arthur Eddington verified this prediction in 1919 by showing, during a solar eclipse, the light coming from distant stars was bent as it went by the sun, shifting the stars' apparent positions. It was only when this prediction was verified that Einstein's theory began to be widely accepted. Because a theory is accepted as true only when its assertions and predictions are tested over and over again and confirmed repeatedly, there is no one moment when a scientific theory suddenly becomes a scientific fact. A theory becomes a fact, or a truth, when so much evidence has accumulated in its favor, and there is no decisive evidence against it, that virtually all reasonable people will accept it. This does not mean that a true theory will never be falsified. All scientific truth is provisional, subject to modification in light of new evidence. There is no alarm bell that goes off to tell scientists that they finally hit on the ultimate, unchangeable truths about nature. As we'll see, it is possible that despite thousands of observations that support Darwinism, new data might show it to be wrong. I think this is unlikely, but scientists, unlike zealots, can't afford to become arrogant about what they accept as true. In the process of becoming truths or facts, Scientific theories are usually tested against alternative theories. After all, there are usually several explanations for a given phenomenon. Scientists try to make key observations or conduct decisive experiments that will test one rival explanation against another. 
For many years, the position of the Earth's land masses was thought to have been the same throughout the history of life. But in 1912, the German geophysicist Alfred Wegener came up with the rival theory of continental drift, proposing that continents had moved about. Initially, his theory was inspired by the observation that the shapes of continents like South America and Africa could be fitted together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Continental drift then became more certain as fossils accumulated and paleontologists found that the distribution of ancient species suggested that the continents were once joined. Later, plate tectonics was suggested as a mechanism for continental movement, just as natural selection was suggested as the mechanism for evolution. The plates of the Earth's crust and mantle floated about on more liquid material in the Earth's interior. And although plate tectonics was also greeted with skepticism by geologists, it was subject to rigorous testing on many fronts, yielding convincing evidence that it is true. Now, thanks to global positioning satellite technology, we can even see the continents moving apart, at a speed of two to four inches per year, about the same rate that your fingernails grow. This, by the way, combined with the unassailable evidence that the continents were once connected, is evidence against the claim of young Earth creationists that the Earth is only six to ten thousand years old. If that were the case, we'd be able to stand on the west coast of Spain and see the skyline of New York City, for Europe and America would have moved less than a mile apart. When Darwin wrote The Origin, most Western scientists, and nearly everyone else, were creationists. While they might not have accepted every detail of the story laid out in Genesis, most thought that life had been created pretty much in its present form, designed by an omnipotent creator, and had not changed since. In the origin, Darwin provided an alternative hypothesis for the development, diversification, and design of life. Much of that book presents evidence that not only supports evolution, but at the same time refutes creationism. In Darwin's day, the evidence for his theories was compelling but not completely decisive. We can say, then, that evolution was a theory, albeit a strongly supported one, when first proposed by Darwin, and since 1859 has graduated to facthood as more and more supporting evidence has piled up. Evolution is still called a theory, just like the theory of gravity, but it's a theory that is also a fact. So how do we test evolutionary theory against the still popular alternative view that life was created and remained unchanged thereafter? There are actually two kinds of evidence. The first comes from using the six tenets of Darwinism to make testable predictions. By predictions, I don't mean that Darwinism can predict how things will evolve in the future. Rather, it predicts what we should find in living or ancient species when we study them. Here are some evolutionary predictions. Since there are fossil remains of ancient life, we should be able to find some evidence for evolutionary change in the fossil record. The deepest and oldest layers of rock would contain the fossils of more primitive species, and some fossils should become more complex as the layers of rock become younger, with organisms resembling present-day species found in the most recent layers and we should be able to see some species changing over time, forming lineages showing descent with modification, adaptation. We should be able to find some cases of speciation in the fossil record, with one line of descent dividing into two or more, and we should be able to find new species forming in the wild. We should be able to find examples of species that link together major groups suspected to have common ancestry, like birds with reptiles and fish with amphibians. Moreover, these missing links, more aptly called transitional forms, should occur in layers of rock that date to the time when the groups are supposed to have diverged. We should expect that species show genetic variation for many traits, otherwise there would be no possibility of evolution happening. Imperfection is the mark of evolution, not of conscious design we should then be able to find cases of imperfect adaptation, 
in which evolution has not been able to achieve the same degree of optimality as would a creator. We should be able to see natural selection acting in the wild. In addition to these predictions, Darwinism can also be supported by what I call retrodictions, fact and data that aren't necessarily predicted by the theory of evolution, but make sense only in the light of the theory of evolution. Retrodictions are a valid way to do science. Some of the evidence supporting plate tectonics, for example, came only after scientists learned to read ancient changes in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, from patterns of rocks on the seafloor. Some of the retrodictions that support evolution, as opposed to special creation, include patterns of species distribution on the Earth's surface, peculiarities of how organisms develop from embryos, and the existence of vestigial features that are of no apparent use. These are the subjects of chapters 3 and 4. Evolutionary theory, then, makes predictions that are bold and clear. Darwin spent some twenty years amassing evidence for his theory before publishing The Origin. That was more than a hundred and fifty years ago. So much knowledge has accumulated since then. So many more fossils found, so many more species collected and their distributions mapped around the world. So much more work in uncovering the evolutionary relationships of different species. And whole new branches of science, undreamt of by Darwin, have arisen including molecular biology and systematics, the study of how organisms are related. As we'll see, all the evidence, both old and new, leads ineluctably to the conclusion that evolution is true.